We'll, we're we're going to start with uh, Emma, and then we will go on to uh, Dick, and then we will go on to John. So, Emma, would you like to open proceedings for us? Thank you. Thanks, Peter, for that kind introduction, I think. I think John and I might refer you to another newspaper for next time. Um, it's a great delight to be here in this wonderful venue, and thanks to all of you for coming to this breakfast meeting. Um, I'm going to talk about housing, given that I'm the Shadow Housing Minister. I'm sure that will come as no surprise. So housing is a big priority uh, for the Labour Party. Uh, when I was given this position, Ed Miliband also promoted the position to the Shadow Cabinet. Um, that's around 18 months ago. Also, Ed has made housing very much a centrepiece of his conference speeches, including uh, his commitment and our commitment to be building at least 200,000 homes a year by 2020. Um, where are we at the moment? Well, we're not even building half the number of homes that we need uh, in England. And by the way, I'm the Shadow Housing Minister for England because it is devolved. Um, and in London, we're not even building a third of the homes we need. So we have an acute shortage of homes. Now, much as I would like to tell you that all these problems started in May 2010, I think that would be slightly disingenuous. Uh, but it is also true to say that we've seen the lowest level of house building uh, under this government in any time, peacetime, since the 1920s. And most, something that most concerns me too is that we've seen falling uh, numbers of affordable uh, homes and a record number of people in their 20s and early 30s <coughs> living at home with their parents. Lots of parents have come up to me and told me how they're craving an empty nest in the last year and a half that I've done this job. Um, and that is really frustrating for those young uh, people. And home ownership levels at their lowest for 30 years, particularly amongst that age cohort between 20 and 35. I think it's clear that there is no one silver bullet to solving what is a very deep housing crisis, one that has deep and long uh, roots. That's why we asked Sir Michael Lyons to set up a housing commission uh, with a panel of experts taken from across the industry and sector to work on a set of proposals. Um, and he's uh, come up with a very comprehensive uh, long-term, if you like, long-term plan uh, in order for us in government to tackle the housing crisis. I'll give you a flavour of that, but I'm sure we can get into some of the other recommendations in the discussion. We want to make sure that local authorities take their responsibilities seriously and that they have a local plan in place uh, at the latest by December 2016. Uh, otherwise, the planning inspector or another body will go in and help them make that plan. Um, we need to make sure that homes are built in the uh, places where people want them and the right places. Um, and we need to also um, give local councils more flexibility and power uh, to tackle land banking, but also to um, set up uh, new homes corporations with neighbouring local authorities to directly commission out uh, pieces of land rather than just taking a reactive approach to planning which has very much been the characteristic of our system for quite some time. Um, we want to see a more competitive industry. The big builders are really, really important but the last time we were building 200,000 homes a year 25 years ago small builders were building two thirds of those new homes. Now they barely build a third of new homes. Um, we want to see a new generation of garden cities and new towns something that I'm sure we'll get into in the discussion um, we want to make sure that councils have the power to reserve uh, a number, a proportion of new homes on significant housing sites for first-time uh, buyers because it's certainly the case that first-time buyers are struggling and the people who are suffering most from the housing crisis are those young people I mentioned earlier. And finally, we do want a fairer and more stable private rented sector, somebody who's rented in both France and uh, Belgium, I think that we do have an incredibly short-term uh, uh, system, one that is very, very insecure uh, for the tenant. But obviously we've got to make sure that the protections are there for landlords as well. So we want to legislate to make three-year tenancies the norm, not with rent controls. Don't believe what you read in some of the uh, newspapers or what you hear from some of John's colleagues, particularly Grant Chaps, who seems to think we go to Venezuela to be inspired for our ideas. We actually didn't go as far as that. We went to Ireland, where they have uh, got a very, very similar system, albeit with four-year uh, tenancies with a limit on rent increases after year one and two. Uh, 
for us in the three-year tenancies, the market would set the rent in the first place. So overall, housing is a big issue for us. Uh, we don't have a shortage of policy. We're very determined come May the 8th to make sure that as a nation, we start to make the market deliver for the, um, in terms of the housing that people need, given that we have such an acute shortage. Thank you. Emma, thank you very much for that. And uh, Dick, could you tell us, uh, does the Liberal Democrat view vary much from the Labour view or from the Conservative view on housing well, issues? Let me... Uh Set it out. Uh, and okay. you, you can uh, uh, make your own uh, minds up. Um, I mean, in general elections, of all the property issues that you grapple with, uh, housing really is the only one that gains any attention. Uh, and, and since uh, Mrs Thatcher's promise uh, of council house sales, uh, housing has been at best, during my political lifetime, uh, a second order election issue. Even at this election, when, uh, as Emma said, there's a widespread recognition that we've got a near crisis in housing provision, particularly in some parts of the country. Housing will struggle against the other big issues, economy, health, education, immigration, Europe, uh, to gain uh, consistent media uh, attention. Uh, and although for the first time for many years, uh, all the parties uh, will have a, or most of the parties will have a manifesto target for new housing, none of them or none of us except the Greens are coming anything near uh, the common housing uh, target, uh, which all the parties set 50 years ago, 500,000 uh, new houses uh, to be built uh, per annum. So the challenge of all the parties grappling with this is how to increase the supply of housing by finding the space uh, and the funding to do it. Lib Dems plan to increase uh, house building uh, over the Parliament to hit uh, 300,000 uh, per annum, uh, and will produce over the first year of the next uh, government uh, a detailed plan of how to achieve it. Amongst other things, we'd require local authorities to plan to meet 15 years of housing need and strengthen the duty to cooperate to help bounded authorities like Oxford and Cambridge uh, to grow. <coughs> we'd create at least 10 uh, garden cities and other garden communities. We'd give the Homes and Communities Agency new powers to bring forward development on public sector sites, and where the market isn't delivering on these plans, we give government agencies uh, the powers to directly commission houses for sale and rent, uh, an approach which is already being piloted uh, in Cambridgeshire. <coughs> on affordable housing, we'd allow local authorities more flexibility to borrow to build affordable housing, including council houses. We'd maintain the Treasury's loan guarantee programme, which has, for example, allowed housing associations to raise hundreds of millions of pounds for new housing for rent. We support intermediate ownership and rental options, including shared ownership and a new rent-to-own model. We'd reform the spare room subsidy so that it would apply to new tenants and those who've turned down a reasonable offer of alternative social rented accommodation. We'd require homes to be built to zero carbon standard uh, and support the development of off-site manufacturing techniques to deliver them. And in order to deal with the severe skill shortage in the construction industry, we'd expand apprenticeships <coughs> by offering more employer grants. And to ensure that everybody paid their fair share, we'd introduce new higher council tax bans on the most expensive properties. Thank you very much, Dick. Uh, finally, uh, John. Thank you, you very much. Your stall. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I must admit, I was in a debate on the um, future of NATO and the SDSR at uh, 9 o'clock yesterday when the call came through. I've done my best to accommodate all the subjects that are on your list. What I thought I'd do to start off with is, is talk about where we are now in terms of the context for housing, planning, and uh, that's, uh, then address about eight topics uh, quickly so then before we go to questions. I think it's important to remember where we've come from when we took office in 2010. Uh, things were in uh, considerable disarray and in the last full year uh, house building fell to levels not seen since the 1920s. There's been a lot of progress since then. Nearly 192,000 households have been helped on the housing ladder through the various initiatives uh, of the government. And of course now we have this uh, situation where interest rates are very low and five-year uh, fixed rate mortgages are lowest on record. The government have, take, have adopted a number of schemes which I'll come talk to briefly, uh, but we have delivered 538,000 new homes since April 2010, including, I think, significantly 217,000 affordable homes. 
and we're seeing that the rate of new homes starting are increasing progressively. And last year, 2014, 137,000 is the highest for seven years. And we had 100,000 homes in 2012, 120,000 in 2013. If we carry on at this rate, we will be uh, producing 200,000 homes by 2017. Now, help to buy is the one of the most significant uh, schemes where we've helped 77,000 uh, to get on the ladder, and 90% of those have been outside of London, which I think is significant, um, uh, and 80% to first-time buyers. Um, there are two sort of schemes available there, and I think they've worked quite well, the, the equity loan scheme and the mortgage guarantee scheme. But affordable housing is really important. As I said, over the last five years, 217,000 affordable <coughs> homes have, have been delivered. Um, there's been 38 billion of, of public and private investment. And rent to buy there has been really significant, uh, where uh, people would be in a rented home uh, at 80% of the market rent for five years whilst they save to buy their home. But the context for all of this has been the planning reforms, where I think two principles underpinned that, which was really simplification and greater certainty, reducing the 1,000 pages to 50 in terms of planning guidance. We're now in a situation where, under the previous government, just one in six councils had a plan. Now 80% have brought forward plans, the vast majority of which uh, have been ratified. And that is really significant because it gives some certainty for people seeking to bring forward development. Um, if I think briefly about the private rented sector, I think it's important to consider the fact that we have 1.6 million people in this country who let out properties. And I think it's important that we don't disrupt that uh, unnecessarily. And we've seen average tenancy lengths increase by 6% now to 46 months, nearly four years. And of course, 81% uh, over four in five of private renters uh, moving uh, in the last three years ended their tenancy because they wanted to move, not because there was some compulsion from um, a, a unscrupulous landlord. But as ever, there's more to be done. Obviously, the Prime Minister yesterday made uh, announcements on starter homes, which were, uh, I think has, has gone down well. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I? But um, uh, the, the principle there is to really tackle this problem of first-time buyers. So we've said it will be for people under the age of 40. Uh, the value would be £250,000 outside of London, £450,000 within London. And we hope to do this without the need for more legislation. Uh, what will happen is that you, local authorities will not seek 106 affordable housing or SIL on those properties. It will be using commercial and industrial land that has been deemed unusable uh, to date. Um, <coughs> and we've also used a design advisory panel to ensure that these are of the highest quality. Um, we, then on the development land tax, one of the other topics you asked me to address, uh, the government, the Conservative Party, has no plans to deliver that <laughs> after the election. Uh, we have gr given greater discretion to local authorities on 106 and SIL, and we've introduced a 10-unit threshold on affordable housing contributions uh, to help smaller schemes, and it's been an intention to try and stimulate smaller developments. We have no intention uh, to bring in a homes tax, uh, which we don't think would be good, particularly for uh, th those people in London who bought their properties 20 years ago and now find themselves subject to that annual tax. And also, we're very wary, I think, of council tax rebanding the lesson, if we do look to Wales, is where they did that. Four times as many homes moved up bands than down. Uh, and so that, you know, that's something that we certainly have no plans to, to introduce. So that's a, a quick canter over the issues. I just must say, I do spend most of my time as um, personally picked slave to Eric Pickles, just sat behind ministers. I do try and listen, but that's my summation of where I think we've got to. John, that, that was a very good summation. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive. Um, uh, now we move to the sort of slightly non-political side of things with uh, Ian, first of all, from the BPF. Ian, just set out what the BPF's agenda is from this, uh, from either, all any parties at the moment. What is it you want them to do? Certainly, Peter. Um, I'm going to be absolutely shameless in that um, 
we got our manifestos uh, printed and they arrived this morning. Um, oh, wave it so, about, wave it about. So <laughs> we, uh, and they, they li literally still are warm. You can sort of use them as knee warmers. So there we are, look I at pa that. pass those along. Good, um, good bit of lobbying, well done. <laughs> I think um, in terms of the... When I was thinking about this speech last night, um, what I didn't want to come across was a bit like my, my, my ten-year-old. Um, my ten-year-old is an only child, and it's, um, you know, I want, I want, I want, I want. And uh, so I, I, I wanted the first part just really to articulate actually what this, this sector can give. It's, you know, it is about out, out giving as well as, as well as receiving. And, uh, you know, I, I've had 13 fabulous years in this sector and uh, you've seen what it, what it can do, what it can do for communities and, uh, and uh, the general population. Um, yeah, it's fabulous in terms of it's not only a direct contributor uh, to the, the growth of the economy, but is also a, an enabler um, of that growth. You, know, you need um, you know, fabulous homes, you need excellent business space to have a more productive economy. And, uh, yeah, that, that's something I'd want to articulate. I think it's also, um, you know, in, a, in a population that is growing and that is getting older, an excellent place for putting your pension savings, um, making those secure uh, long-term investments that uh, uh, will deliver you an income in old age. Um, I would hope, um, and certainly we've had a lot of engagement with the political parties, that we can be a part of the solution to the housing crisis, delivering uh, quality institutional invested rent rental um, housing. I think um, we have a world beating um, property services sector, m many of whom are in the room today, um, that is excellent at attracting inward investment into our country and also exporting ex expertise to all parts of the globe. And uh, although we're in the, the heart of Mayfair, um, I think we have an industry who uh, is quite unique, um, perhaps along with retailing, uh, in, in terms of contributing to the well-being <coughs> of just about every constituency, if not all constituencies in this country. Um, the I want now, <laughs> I suppose, um, you know, the things that the sector come to me with are, uh, we, 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 we would like to see uh, the uh, business rate and council tax system is in, in desperate need of reform. Um, I think the sector wants to see a stable, streamlined and well-resourced planning system and has concerns about 50 billion of cuts in the next, the next parliament and uh, you know, will, that, will that remain the case in terms of well-resourced planning? You know, I work in a sector that is extremely um, international and I pick up a nervousness in the I think, insular tone um, of political discourse at the moment, um, you know, whether that be towards UK membership of the EU, um, to, towards uh, immigration policy and more generally international investment. Uh, I work in a sector who wants to see, I think, a continued drive and inventiveness to find ways of funding infrastructure in, uh, in tight times. Uh, I work in a sector, I think, who um, wants to um, support uh, those city leaders out there with, with a vision and uh, give them the tools to do the job. Um, I work in a sector who would agree with, I think, Nick Rainsford that uh, uh, the mansion tax is, is bad policy. Um, as said, I work in a sector that um, I think wants to be part of the nation's housing solution, but is concerned about um, residential tenancy and rent reform. And uh, I work in a sector that wants to contribute to uh, the uh, sustainability and energy efficiency of the nation, uh, but wants to see a clear roadmap because my sector invests for 10, 20, 30 years and uh, needs that clarity uh, to be able to, to invest properly. Ian, thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll fi we'll finalise the sort of opening statements with Steve, uh, uh, who's going to take a very pragmatic view on what he's listened to and tell you what he thinks himself. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was rather unfair on uh, Emma and um, Dick to say that uh, Chappell spent 14 years as a Tory Member of Parliament was completely apolitical. Because um, I'm not, actually, for what it's worth. Anybody who reads my um, stuff in Property Week knows I'm a sort of right-wing Tory ranter. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, I, I, should, I should make that clear. Is that my microphone? Thank you. 
Who's I hope not. Anyway, for what it's worth. Now, let me just say, actually, therefore, just to allay Emma's fears, because I actually agree with a lot of what she said. I mean, it um, seems to me that the issue we've got in this country is that we simply don't have enough homes. Um, uh, they are, in many parts of the world, but not all parts of the UK, unaffordable. Um, and therefore, the issue really is one for all the political parties. And again, Emma, I think, um, said right at the start, there's no one single silver bullet. How do you actually um, increase the number of homes for people that are affordable for them and which fulfil their needs? Um, and actually, I think you can, uh, in a sense, uh, break this issue down in a way that perhaps we haven't yet done. Um, uh, lack of supply and unaffordability tend to go together. I mean, it's kind of first rule of economics that where supply is low and demand is high, price tends to rise. And, and that's clearly something that we've seen. And on the back of that, um, the inescapable conclusion is that what we should be doing is building a lot more homes. And now, you know, the various political parties have ideas as to how you do that. Um, most of them are unexceptional in the sense that they don't cross any great political divide. The Starter Homes Initiative uh, can work, and it can work by effectively using the 106 um, uh, and perhaps even using uh, you know, local authority land deals to make that the 20% discount an actual um, you know, deliverable proposition. Uh, we probably need to see more strength around um, property asset classes, around things like PRS. So if we do want to see PRS grow, one of the things we shouldn't be doing is letting uh, those who intend to deliver PRS have to compete in the open market with the developer who wants to do a buy, build and sell. Because I think most people in this room will understand that if you simply put all sites up on the basis that you, you buy and then you decide what you want to deliver, um, then we as a nation will find it very, very difficult to get PRS really launched in the way that I think most of us need. And I'd add to that that in London, for example, one of the things I've identified is the um, really growing issue around young people finding anywhere that they can afford to live. Uh, and the growth of things like uh, what I call graduate accommodation as a subset, if you like, of student accommodation. Um, same sort of issue, you know, nine square meters with a wet room and so on, with communal facilities, concierge, whatever, a single amount to pay. 250, 300 a week, um, really for people in that 25 to 55 sort of salary bracket who come to London for the first time and simply cannot afford to live anywhere. Now, at the moment, um, the department, um, uh, Eric's department and indeed the GLA, are struggling with the difference between HMOs on the one hand, which we're not desperately keen um, to see because of the risk of exploitation of HMOs and a valid asset class which will fill a very valuable hole. So yes, I'm, I'm keen to see uh, all sorts of initiatives tried to deliver more public housing. Um, I've just made a note of a few of them. Uh, PRS, as I say, graduate accommodation, um, help to buy has, its, um, has had an effect. Uh, it's had a slightly, of course, counter effect in the sense that it seemed to have pushed um, house prices up to some degree. But it's interesting, as John points out, that the vast majority of sales were actually outside London, where that's much less likely to have been the case. So I'm, I think the risk was worth taking, and I think the initiative was right. Um, uh, and um, uh, you, you know, in, in many other ways, garden cities, yes, I think we've got to have them. I'm one of those who's always said, don't relax the green belt just yet. Why? Well, because it's too easy a solution. Because actually, if you look in London, for example, where many of us I know will, will, will work, I, I certainly do, um, you look at sites like Old Oak Common, you know, where we're talking in terms of 25 to 35,000 homes. You look at Barking Reach, the other side of London, where we, there are, you know, there's capacity for a similar number of homes. Um, you know, what this um, says to me, particularly when you also look at densities in our residential high streets, where we're talking, you know, retail plus two plus mansard, and you look around the whole of Europe, you'll see it's more like retail plus four plus mansard. You know, there's a lot of 
internal development we need to be doing in London before we look at the, at the Green Belt. But nonetheless, do I think that the Green Belt should be held up as some religious um, you know, principle? Probably not, because it was arbitrary when it was drawn, and uh, you know, as cities inexorably grow, London already passed its highest point ever in its history. We may need to look again at, uh, at the Green Belt. Um, certainly, as I say, at, at things like garden homes. Um, I would just stress one issue, however, um, you know, there are parts of the country where you can't give homes away. That famous story in Stoke-on-Trent, you know, where the council effectively said, buy a home for a pound. And they were desperately um, disappointed when nobody took the offer up. And the reason was because the amount you would have had to spend to develop that home to a livable standard was greater than the open market value of those homes. Now, what that points to is something which uh, you know, I'm very enthusiastic about personally, which is the role of connectivity. Uh, in this particular case, I think HS2 is a classic example, but Crossrail also. All these major schemes, which I've certainly been involved in most of my political life. Why? Well, because people don't actually look to the distance between their home and where they work as being the really relevant criterion. It's the time it takes to get from their home to where they work that matters. And if we can shorten that, if we can you know, bring some of these areas of the country where actually homes are currently utterly worth less in a country where you know, 200 miles away they are completely unaffordable, if we can start to make the link there that allows that kind of connectivity, then I think we'll begin to see uh, big changes. I should just say, Peter, if I may, some of the things that I think don't help. Um, if you look at the mansion tax, it is actually technically deliverable. It might have pretty awful impact on people who, uh, I think as John said, you know, will have simply bought a house 20 years ago, particularly if it's a surviving spouse living on a part pension. Uh, who is classically asset rich and cash poor. And I, I think in London, we all know that these mansions are not mansions. The vast majority of them are fairly modest apartments in, in, in nicer parts of the country. But there's one, in, pardon me, one interesting thing. You may say it was an, an, an inequitable tax, but you can't say it wouldn't work. I mean, people are, after all, forced to pay it. It might be appalling that they were forced to, but uh, nonetheless, they, they, they would pay. Um, personally, I'm not against reforming council tax bans, I should say. I do think there's a case for a couple of extra bans at the level at which they would, for example, perhaps double the current top band of council tax and maybe even treble it for homes worth 10 million or more. It seems to me it's kind of an obvious thing to do. But there are some taxes which actually have an actual counter effect to the one that's proposed. The classic, and I'm very pleased to hear MS say that Labour will not be introducing rent control. I say it as you know, as generously as I possibly can, don't do it because it doesn't work. Because the effect of it has is to take potential landlords out of the market, both institutional and private, and therefore deprive people of the very homes that you want to build. Don't be, uh, for example, persuaded to uh, ban letting agents fees, which um, is an extraordinary element in the Labour manifesto. Again, how do you think people find the homes that they actually need to be able to rent? You know, there are certain ways in which you can develop taxation policies which are actually positively harmful. They're a classic. I'd actually add to that this idea of taxing empty homes. First of all, you'd have to define what empty means. I mean, it always amuses me when they talk about lights off in Belgravia. Anybody who watches Downton Abbey, um, anybody not watch Downton Abbey? <laughs> no? Oh, God, there's, uh, look, I mean, which igloo have you been living in? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I watch it because it's the price I pay for getting match of the day. So, you know, I mean, but I'll tell you this, what you know if you watch, and I'll just say it for this gentleman uh, here who obviously, you know, needs to get out more, um, which is that, which is that um, they, of course, live in a castle in, in Hampshire, but they have a large house in Belgravia, which they visit three weeks of the year during the season. And my point, of course, is that when those homes were built, they were built for effectively absentee landlords. We shouldn't get exercised by the fact that at the top end of the global city, <coughs> some properties are left largely unused for a long time. Um, anybody who has a home maybe in Spain or France that they visit um, might just uh, reflect on how much they are an absentee landlord. 
seems to me that if we start getting into that sort of issue again, it's where taxation just delivers exactly the opposite conclusion from the one that you want to draw. So, the conclusion for me is, there's a lot of common sense around, there's a lot that all three parties agree on, fundamentally we all agree that we need to build more and we need to make what we have more affordable. As long as we're pursuing that and that alone, then I'm relaxed about any of the three parties actually emerging in government.